Albany, New York has always been overshadowed by its larger neighbor down the river, New York City. In the 1960s, in an effort to bring new attention and vitality to the Empire State's capital city, newly elected Governor Nelson Rockefeller proposed what would lead to the creation of the Empire State Plaza, leaving Rockefeller's mark on Albany years after he left office in 1973. When Nelson Rockefeller entered office as the governor of New York in 1959, he hoped to leave a lasting legacy on the state. Soon, he'd find one of the most significant impacts he'd have on the landscape of New York's capital city. 1959 was a significant year for New York's capital city. Not only was it the year of Governor Rockefeller's first term in office, but it was also the 350th anniversary of Henry Hudson's voyage to New York. In honor of that voyage, Princess Beatrix of the Netherlands visited New York, including Albany. As the story goes, on the drive from the executive mansion to the Capitol building, Rockefeller felt embarrassed at the grimy and seedy condition of the state's capital. In response to these feelings of embarrassment, Rockefeller charged into one of the most significant state-led urban renewal projects in the nation, a project which would become Nelson Rockefeller's Empire State Plaza. Taking the first step in executing his vision, Rockefeller asked the New York State Legislature to create a commission to study revitalizing Albany. The bill creating the Temporary State Commission on the Capital City illustrated Rockefeller's vision for the project, stating, The city of Albany, and its role as the capital city of the state, deserves special attention of all the people of the state. It is essential that the state and city of Albany cooperate in a sincere effort to make the capital city one in which all residents of the state can may take proper pride. Albany was not alone in the push to redevelop its urban core. All across the United States, cities were engaging in urban renewal projects in an attempt to revitalize urban cores which had seen disinvestment. Many of these projects targeted impoverished neighborhoods, which were often filled with immigrants and racial minorities. These neighborhoods, whether valid or not, were identified as being blighted. Whether the residents of the community supported these projects hardly mattered, since the Constitution's Fifth Amendment gives the government the right to take people's property, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Another common motive for urban renewal projects was modernizing the city. In the 1950s, cities were seen as decaying, especially due to the neglect in domestic infrastructure from both the Great Depression and World War II. City leaders wanted to bring the city into a new, modern era, which included removing neglected buildings and replacing them with modern structures. Often, the motivation for urban renewal was said to justify new projects. Remember the story about Princess Beatrix's visit to Albany? While Beatrix's visit to Albany was real, Rockefeller's embarrassment at the city was likely an exaggeration made to justify the displacement of hundreds of people in the core of Albany. As historian Victoria Newhouse wrote, the truth of the matter is that Rockefeller had decided to situate his visionary government complex in a lower middle class neighborhood known as the Pastures, which consisted of mostly federal and Victorian houses. She goes on to allege that because of the necessary displacement of almost 6,000 residents from the neighborhood, Rockefeller used the guts proximity east of this area to promote the new project as slum clearance. The complex motivations and realities of these projects show that there can be many overlapping and interacting causes of urban renewal. The political aspect of these projects meant that impoverished neighborhoods could be more easily sacrificed than neighborhoods which had the resources to advocate for their community more effectively. In Albany's case, Rockefeller's justification convinced the state legislature to move forward, leading to planning and construction of the plaza. Despite Rockefeller's vision for a revitalized capital city, it was actually the city government which took the first step to redeveloping parts of Albany. In the fall of 1960, Albany's mayor, Erastus Corning II, worked with local organizations to explore the possibility of redeveloping Albany's downtown. 
The city used a newer planning firm of Candeb, Flessig, and Associates. The firm's plan highlighted a deteriorating neighborhood north of the capital, which should be the site for redevelopment. Ultimately, however, this plan lost favor over Rockefeller's state-sponsored plan. A few months after Albany explored the possibility of redeveloping the city, Rockefeller had the state of New York embark on its own study of urban renewal in Albany. On April 6, 1961, the Temporary State Commission on the Capital City was created to oversee the planning and construction of an urban renewal project in the city. The commission organized a group of three planning firms together as the Associated Planners. They identified five possible sites for the project. However, the only real choice was Rockefeller's personally suggested site of the neighborhood south of the capital. Demolition for the project began in the summer of 1962 and continued into 1965. After demolition, construction for the project began with laying of the cornerstone on June 21, 1965. The plan that was ultimately decided upon called for the construction of a five-story platform which acted as a base for the plaza as well as a parking garage and a connective concourse for the mall. On top of the foundation would be five relatively low buildings, which were the eight-story Justice Building, nine-story Legislative Building, quarter-mile-long five-story Motor Vehicles Building, and two cultural buildings which would sit on the south side next to the, a memorial arch. Additionally, the plan called for a 44-story office tower and six 20-story buildings for different agencies. An irregularly shaped meeting hall was also constructed in the plaza. Due to its ovular shape, the performance hall structure became known as the Egg. The most significant changes from the initial design were focused on the southern end of the mall, where two of the agency buildings weren't built, and the memorial arch was removed in favor of a cultural education center combining the state library and archives. After 15 years of demolition and construction, the project was finished with the dedication ceremony on October 6, 1978, featuring Governor Nelson Rockefeller along with notable city and state officials. When city officials and urban planners propose urban renewal projects, we often talk about their vision and plans for the future. However, little is discussed of the political negotiating which goes into these projects. In the case of Albany, Nelson Rockefeller's influence within the state government allowed him to overpower the municipal government's plan for the capital. Additionally, political considerations were made when finding architects and contractors for the project. Rockefeller wanted them to come from all across the state rather than just from Albany or New York City. This consideration was especially important because the state's legislature's support was vital in ensuring the project had adequate funding. One of the most politically charged parts of the project involved disagreements over state construction contracts. Due to delays in construction, many of the initial contracts needed to be extended in order to adequately pay those who constructed the project. Mixed into this already chaotic process were the state's regulations, which required far more general contractors than there would normally be for a construction project. In order to rectify the demands of the contractors, the state government had to make the unusual decision to adjust the project's budget and pay the contractors. Politics is a significant effect on the process and outcome of urban renewal projects. The political influence of Rockefeller and his ability to convince legislatures to support his vision was essential to the planning and construction of Empire State Plaza. The legacy of the Empire State Plaza project can be seen in a few ways. State officials have largely been receptive to the development. Office workers enjoyed the views of the surrounding city from the office buildings. The offices also became better linked with the regional highway network, which benefited the workers who often lived in the suburbs. However, the project also led to the displacement of around 6,000 residents from the 98.5 acres which were seized by the state for the project. This displacement removed a vibrant neighborhood and replaced it with an opposing government complex. The platform on which the plaza was constructed quite literally put the government on a pedestal, separating it from the surrounding cityscape. The shift in the neighborhood from mixed-use residential and commercial to government-owned buildings also led to a decrease in the tax revenue for the city. For better or for worse, Rockefeller managed to solidify his legacy as governor of New York with the Empire State Plaza's construction. The little-known history of urban planning is important for two reasons. First, the planning decisions of the past still have an impact on people today through the built landscape as well as lasting economic impacts. 
More importantly, we can learn from examples like the Empire State Plaza and its connection to state and local politics in order to more effectively advocate for how we want our cities to look in the future.